Here's a project I've been working on for a while. I've got a stack of Super 8 footage and films, most of which go back to my college years. I've got a pretty good, well-built Canon Super 8 and regular 8 projector. But can I add a digital camera and get frame-by-frame -frame transfers of my footage in a reliable, stable, high-quality way? The result, I built a do-it-yourself, relatively cheap system for high-quality transfers to digital video. Here's a few seconds of the end result. Keep in mind it takes both a good mechanical system and a fair amount of digital fairy dust to get these results. I shot this short film in 1985 on Kodachrome 40 Super 8 sound. Keep watching as I pimp this projector. Well, actually it ends up pretty torn apart, so this video is not for the mechanically squeamish. Let's check out this projector, and I'll explain why it, it's a good choice for this project. First off, and probably most important, it's got the reels on the back, and very little sprockety stuff up front. This leaves plenty of room to sneak in a good digital camera and lens where the original projector lens is. The other thing I like about this projector is that it's got a metal gate and a well-built pressure pad system to keep the film steady. Let's look under the hood. Yikes. There's a lot of stuff in here we won't be needing, like the motor and electrical controls. For transfers, it's better if the projector runs slowly, one or two frames at a time. This belt, though, is great. I can use it to drive the whole mechanism as slow as I want. The other thing, and this will be important later, is that this shutter shaft makes one complete rotation every time a frame is moved into and out of the gate. One rotation equals one frame of film. You can see how this works as a projector. As the motor rotates, it moves the claw mechanism, reels and shutter. The film is covered up by the shutter as it's moving into place, otherwise you'd see a blurry frame sliding in multiple times a second. The shutter is actually not necessary to transfer the film. All we need is the film to be illuminated evenly and held steady in the gate for every frame while the digital camera snaps a picture. So there's three basic areas we need to modify on the projector for our system to work. The light source, the shutter, and the motor. Here's the plan. It changed as I went along and you'll see why. I got these parts to start. These were suggested by another YouTuber in another conversion video, which I've supplied a link to below. This build differs in a couple of important ways, however. This was the original mount I purchased for the camera. It's nice because it has adjustment forward and back, but not up and down. However, this proved to be a problem, so I went with a Zacuto DSLR mount which is sturdy and can be adjusted up and down and locked down tight. This is a stepper motor which I purchased. It's small and has high torque at low speeds. This is a pulley that fits the existing belt and this motor. This is a remote control release for a Panasonic Lumix camera. In this case I planned on using the S5. It's a full frame camera. I like it, but other cameras would work as long as you have a remote. This is an adjustable speed regulator for the stepper motor. I needed a separate driver, which I found out later, to work with this. I'm not an electronics whiz. This is the LED light. It's actually an automotive dome light replacement, but the high brightness and tight arrangement of the LEDs works great as a light source for the tiny Super 8 film. There's a couple other odds and ends I needed as I went along, but these parts, including the projector, were only about a hundred US dollars. The most expensive part of the whole thing is the macro lens and the digital camera. Let's start by removing the things that aren't needed. This is where the bulb would have been. We'll end up using some of the bracketry to hold the new LED light source. 
You might ask why I replaced the existing bulb. Well, it's way too bright and way too hot. Everything else that gets installed will run on 12 volts. So an LED light is great for this use. Very bright, DC voltage, small and not nearly as hot. I think this weird glass thing in the back of the gate was there to protect the film from being melted by the bulb when the projector was paused or slowed. At any rate, out it goes. Now the lens. This is where the camera lens has to go. We'll focus in on the film directly in the gate. Now the back side. Don't need this fan. That's a good thing since the little ball bearings all came out. We'll take out the existing motor and whatever controls aren't needed. I need to make the shutter easier to get at for modification. I started by removing this gear, but then had to take them all out in order to pull the shutter shaft back. The gears drive the reels, so eventually they need to go back in the same way. This shutter has two sets of blades. I'm not sure why, but I think one set was for the slow motion speeds. At any rate, we don't need any shutter blades. My original idea was to just remove these, but they're mounted onto the shaft in a way that drives the pull-down claw. I'm not going to show that because it's too complicated to explain. As it turns out, the simplest thing to do was to use a pair of tin snips and carefully cut off the blades. It's not pretty, but it achieves the desired results. Now, here's where the first modification happens. I need to install a momentary contact switch that trips every time the pull-down claw moves another frame into the gate. I marked a spot on the shutter shaft where this happens. This is where the momentary contact switch has to be activated. I need a way to trip the switch and a way to hold the switch firmly in place. I made this bracket to hold the switch almost against the shutter barrel. As the barrel rotates, it needs something pushing out so that the switch will be activated. This blue stick pin will work fine. Using a very small drill bit, I place a hole at the correct spot and the pin is epoxied in place. That's good. Now the switch. After dismantling the remote control, I figured out which contacts needed to connect in order to activate the camera shutter. I took out all the resistors aligned in the remote control and soldered them in the same arrangement around the momentary switch, leaving the remote cable as it was. After everything was mounted and dried, I hooked up the camera and tested it by rotating the shutter shaft by hand. Yep, the shutter fires at the right spot every time the shaft is rotated. Now it's time to hook up a motor instead of using my hand. I drilled out a piece of metal that would attach the motor to one of the existing AC motor mounts. The mount gets installed, then the motor. I used Loctite on all the screws so nothing would loosen up over time. With the motor installed, I tried out the pulley for positioning of the existing belt. Seems to work fine, so I installed the pulley on the motor shaft. Before things get too complicated inside, I decided to install the LED light next. After screwing around trying to come up with a sturdy way to mount the LED, I decided to buy a Festoon lamp holder for $9. I'm not sure where the name Festoon comes from, but that's the kind of bulb this is. This holder is actually made to mount the LED under a cabinet, but I figured out a way to construct a bracket from existing projector parts that would hold it in place. I also had an extra LED driver that I mounted inside the projector and soldered to the LED fixture. Hopefully that evens out the voltage and reduces any fluctuation in brightness. To diffuse the light, I used some Roscoe diffusion gel. Originally I tried mounting it in a bracket held in front of the LED. This seemed a little clumsy, so I worked out a way of bending it in a semicircle around the LED fixture. I like the semicircle because it diffuses the light direction even more, and hopefully 
will help hide the inevitable small scratches on Super 8 film. This seems like a good place to rant about Super 8. It's really, really small. I built a device like this for 35mm, and in some ways it was easier. The tolerances for any movement of the gate, the light, or the Super 8 projector itself have to be very, very tight, or your image will look like there's an earthquake. Super 8 cameras don't have a proper pressure plate to hold the film steady, so a locked off tripod shot usually has to be digitally stabilized no matter how steady the transfer. There are transfer systems out there that don't use a fixed gate and claw. They capture the film frames as the film is moving and digitally stabilize them. This is okay and fast, but I find that lots of old film is warped and transfers with a wavy motion if not held firmly in a film gate. In addition, some of these systems use machine technology cameras to capture at high speed, limiting the color resolution and dynamic range of the transfer. Sure, there are some high quality Super 8 and Regular 8 transfer systems out there, but I thought it might be fun to try high quality on a budget. Anyway, back to the project. To get the motor working, I needed to add a stepper motor driver to my variable control. After a lot of wiring, as you can see, the whole thing finally came together. The LED light uses a separate 12 volt power supply scarfed from an external USB drive. And the stepper motor uses an off the shelf variable power supply set at 12 volts. Before I set up the camera, I mounted everything securely to a board. Three bolts hold the projector down and two bolts hold the camera mount. Finding a close-up macro lens that can capture a small screen Super 8 image isn't easy. This Leowa 25mm macro full frame does the trick. The only problem I had was that the back part of the barrel was pushing against the projector side when I tried to align it perpendicular to the film gate. I ended up cutting out a small piece of the projector frame to slide the camera and lens over a few more millimeters. It's ugly, but it worked. So, this is it. Let's fire it up and see what happens. The film is loaded onto the top reel. It's pushed into the gate and picked up by the claw movement. Eventually. The system's designed to capture one frame at a time, so it doesn't move really quickly. By running the projector slowly, it not only improves the film handling and safety of the film, but it allows the camera time to process each frame. Theoretically, you could run it faster, but I'm just not in that much of a hurry. I say let the camera do its camera thing. Once the first frame is in the gate, the lens has to be manually focused. This lens is strictly old school. This is tricky as you really need to be sure the grain structure is clearly visible to get maximum detail. You'll notice that the top and bottom of the surrounding frames are visible. This is okay since it helps when you digitally stabilize footage and you can easily crop it out in post. Camera is set to manual exposure. I've found that the lens really shines at around 5.6 and the ISO is set at 640. After some testing I decided to use V-Log for the picture profile as this seems to provide the best highlight renditions for the extra contrasty Kodachrome reversal film I was transferring. Make sure the in-camera stabilization is off and the shutter is set to electronic. No point putting thousands of still snaps on the mechanical shutter or risking vibration. Once everything is set, this button does it all. Using high resolution JPEGs, you can fit an 800 foot Super 8 reel onto about 256 gigabytes. Your files can be output at 18 or 24 frames per second in post, whatever the film was shot at. I also recommend a good noise and dirt reducer. I use Neat Video 5 and it works great. I also use Topaz Labs video enhanced software to sharpen things up. This system isn't for quick, okay quality transfers. 
It's really designed to get the best color and resolution, 4K even, from the tiny Super 8 frame. I don't know how long the original film will last, but I do know that I transferred it the best and most affordable way I could. I'll post updates and tweaks to the system in future videos. If interested, please subscribe.